You know, many Bible readers, whatever their interest or motivations are for reading the Bible, they come to the New Testament and they read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they assume that these four writers, whoever they were, whether you go at the traditional names attributed to these works or not, that they're working together. They're all part of kind of early Christianity as it's emerging in the first century. I do, in fact, think that Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, in that order, wrote their works in the first century. And certainly each of them had connections to the Jesus movement in various ways. But I don't think they like each other. Mark, of course, if he wrote first, would not know the others. And some of you are taking my course on Mark that's being offered now. I'll put the link in the description here. And you will see Mark as Mark. But Matthew comes along and he uses 85 to 90% of Mark. And that's why whenever you're reading the New Testament, a lot of times if you first started, you read Matthew and then you get to Mark and you think, well, I've already read this because so much of it sounds familiar. And you can get the false impression that Matthew is a kind of uh, main gospel and then Mark is a cut down version, like a synopsis or something, a short one, short version of it. And actually the opposite is the case and even more. Mark wrote first 16 chapters. Matthew overwrites Mark. Yes, he does incorporate roughly 90% or so, maybe more, of Mark. But the question is, how does he incorporate it? What does he do when he pulls something in? And time and time again, we find that he is unhappy with Mark. He changes Mark. And Luke does the same thing. I'm going to just throw out a few examples, and if you get into my course on Mark, you'll see more in depth how this works. But for example, in chapter two of Mark, and Mark wrote first, I think uh, many, many of us in the scholarly world agree with that. Uh, Jesus is uh, accused by his enemies for allowing his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. Now, there's a lot to say about the story, but the conclusion in Mark is very radical. It's what ethicists call situational ethics. The Sabbath is made for people, not people for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And he seems to be using Son of Man there to mean almost like human beings. If the Sabbath is made for man or humans, not humans for the Sabbath. In other words, commandments are for human good. And you judge how to keep a commandment, such as resting on the Sabbath, by the question of what sort of good does it promote, whether that of an animal or a human. So this was debated in the time of Jesus. Matthew clearly has a problem with that. And he takes out the phrase, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, he knows he's doing it. He has his copy of Mark. It's not missing. He takes it out. And then he adds two stories about how the priests work on the Sabbath, and they're guiltless. And why do they work on the Sabbath? Because of the temple. They're serving the temple. And Jesus is greater than the temple Therefore, the disciples can pick grain or do anything else on the Sabbath if they're serving him. So suddenly the story is completely altered. This idea of harmonizing, you can't take Mark's account, Mark 2, and Matthew's account, I think it's chapter 12, and merge them together because you're not going to get a harmony. You're going to get a conglomeration of how Matthew tried to overwrite Mark. This is really clear if you look at them side by side. I encourage people to get this uh, Gospel Parallels, or there's another version here that you can find, the American Bible Society, where you have all four Gospels. And to study those, because in these works, you can see side by side the different texts and how they fall 
and how one is overriding or repeating another. And I do a lot of that in the course. Another example would be when Peter confesses Jesus finally as the Christ. In Mark, it's very climactic. It's in chapter 8. And then Jesus starts talking about his suffering, and Peter rebukes him. And then Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. And so you've got this idea that Peter's confession, although the words are right, you are the Christ, he doesn't have the understanding. And then three other times in Mark, as Jesus talks about who he is and what's going to happen, particularly his suffering, the disciples are asking things like, uh, but who will be on the right and left hand when we have glory? And who will really reign and who will really be the first and who is the greatest and so forth? So it actually shows that Peter's confession is without understanding. I would say it's a false confession because if you say a word and don't understand what it means, then the confession is not really valid meaning your understanding of it is invalid. And that's the case in Mark. Well, Matthew's not going to let that stand. Luke, by the way, just takes it out. He takes out the whole thing. It's just gone. Take a look. You're reading along in Mark, and if you look at the parallel in Luke, he's like, hey, all this stuff about calling Peter Satan and saying he's wrong, get rid of that. In fact, Luke takes the failure of the disciples out throughout his gospel. You know, the shortest verse in Mark, and it's very chilling, is when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Mark says one verse short, and they all forsook him and fled. Talking about the apostles, Luke just takes that out. So back to the confession of Peter, uh, Luke just takes it out. But what does Matthew do? He adds a blessing of Peter. He keeps the dispute about get behind me Satan and the rebuke, but then he adds the blessing of Peter. You are Peter and you've made a right confession and I'm going to build the church on this. So do you see how he is very troubled by the way Mark stands as it is? So it's not a matter of harmonizing, it's a matter of rewriting and overwriting. I'm not just trying to destroy anybody's faith here and people can read these texts as they want but you should read them carefully. Critically means carefully. To read carefully, see what Mark says, see how Matthew uses his source Mark, see how Luke uses his source Mark, and what their interests and concerns are. And you're going to find that what they do, they do repeatedly. A final example, and there's so many more in the course, but it's in Mark 10 where Jesus is asked, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And he's called good rabbi, good teacher. And Jesus rebukes the man and says, why are you calling me good? There's only one good God. Mark is very big on the one God, Shema. Hero is or the Lord our God is one. Jesus quotes that and commends a scribe for recognizing that if you love God, the one God, and love your neighbor as yourself, that's more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices of the temple. And there's a lot more on that as we go through Mark in the course to show that's one of the motifs of Mark. Well, Matthew just takes that out. He basically says, why do you ask me about the good? Well, come on. The text is, why do you call me good? There's one good God. That's just gone. So you find this all the way through. And I really encourage my students, and if you take this course, you're going to be my student in that sense, to just do a careful reading of these materials, a critical, careful reading, so that you really know what each one says, and you try to analyze and understand why we have overwritten versions of Mark in Matthew and further in Luke, and what's going on here and what the issues are. This is really how to study Christian origins and to deal with the texts that we have. So I hope you'll get the course. This is not just to push for the course. I'm uh, doing that, of course, because I want you to take it. But I want you to take it because in all the years that I taught this course at three different universities, my students invariably, whether they're skeptics, 
believers, evangelical Christians, whatever, they found that the study of Mark was the thing that was most inspiring to them. So take a look at the link, get the course, and later on, we're gonna have a webinar session for all the students who took the course. And uh, we'll make it lengthy. We'll let people ask questions and bring up things and we'll talk back and forth about it probably into February when we give everybody a chance to uh, study and get through the course. So take care, everybody. I hope you found this video helpful and full of information and maybe inspiration.